everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Lee, and I'm one of the founders and owners of Green to Go Recreational Cannabis. Uh, my wife, Jessica Lee, is the other owner and founder. Um, today, yeah, we were, uh, uh, I'm just really delighted to be here, invited by Confluent to come address you guys and about us and about the industry and answer questions and hopefully uh, move forward a really productive dialogue about the opportunities in the cannabis industry uh, and the areas for improvement in the cannabis industry and uh, maybe we can figure out some ways that we can all make some money um, down the road. Um, so about the founders, I'll just read this because I, I want to make sure it's all said. Um, Steve Lee, that's me. Uh, I'm a native of the Tri-Cities and I'm a proud graduate of Leadership Tri-Cities, Class 15. I've worked in many areas of the community, uh, including in the hospitality and service industry, the Pasco Chamber of Commerce, the Richland Public Facilities District, other charitable causes, politics, uh, and some other areas too. Uh, my wife holds degrees from the University of Washington in Law, Society, and Justice, and has formal education in the costs, both economic and social, of prohibitionist state policies. Uh, my wife also owns i502guide.com and Stashbox Enterprises, which is our educational and marketing uh, branded focused company. Uh, and Green to Go is a proud member of both the Tri City Regional Chamber of Commerce and the West Richland Area Chamber of Commerce. This is actually a little bit of an old presentation. Since this has been uh, created, we actually joined every Chamber of Commerce in the Tri-Cities. We're still waiting on the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, but we just joined the West Richland Chamber, the Regional Chamber, the Pasco Chamber, the Benton City Chamber, and we were just uh, accepted as a member of the Chairman's Circle of TriDec. So we're the first cannabis business to represent in any one of those organizations in our community. Uh, and we hope to get every other meaningful organization checked off on the first list, too. Um, let's see here. Recreate responsibly. Uh, that's one of our main calls to action uh, whenever we talk about our business to people. Uh, the first uh, piece of education about our business that you'll learn real fast is this giant disclaimer down here. I'm not gonna read it because it's on the screen behind me. Uh, anytime we talk about cannabis or our business or do anything that's a printed piece of paper, even on our business cards, they have to have this disclaimer on there so we can operate. Uh, because it is just like, to the, to the regulatory agencies, we're technically as bad as cigarettes uh, and somehow just as good as medicine. So. There's a lot of rules uh, on both sides of that conundrum, um, so this sort of helps us out there. Basically, keep away from kids and pets, uh, you know, treat, treat it like you would anything else. Or maybe don't if you're bad with your children and pets. Um, okay, so this is our history abridged. Um, the medical marijuana industry in Washington State has been through many phases. Uh, the first phase in 1998, Washington State legalized medical marijuana through a voter initiative. Uh, that added RCW 6951A. Uh, and that was the underregulated marijuana market uh, that no longer exists as of today, as of July 1st of, of this year. Um, all of the, the rampant uh, growth of pot shops you've seen all over the state all came from basically what is an unregulated or underregulated gray market, uh, meaning there's some foundational laws that keep people from going directly to jail, um, but there aren't enough laws to make it actually legal. Um, and so that's what a gray market is. I'll use that term a lot. It's really a more fair term than black market. Um, so gray market is, is defined as people that are trying to follow the rules that exist and maybe trying to fill in the gaps. Black market is the people that say hell to that and, and don't even follow those rules. <laughs> so the gray market medical marijuana industry, my wife and I started with Twisted Hard Candies in 2012 and that was a medical marijuana collective that made uh, keef based hard candy for patients. There wasn't any local edibles production at that stage um, and we had some unique experiences that made us really great for that. So that was our first actual foray into the formalized business world of, of medical marijuana. Uh, after that, that was a, about a six-month endeavor, or a year endeavor, we started Green to Go Delivery because uh, I got laid off from my cushy government job and I had no other choices. How's it going? How are you? Good. Yeah. You wanna, uh, no no hey, chairs. Oh, no. oh, you got it right here. Oh, yeah, sweet. Yeah. Okay. Over here too. Sweet. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> I didn't know I was there. So we started Green to Go Delivery. Um, I got laid off. Uh, I was uh, going to get married. We were in a way too expensive house at the time and we're halfway into planning our wedding and needed income. It was actually my dad's idea, and he said, hey, I heard somebody else is, is doing this and not going to jail. Uh, I know you sell pot. Maybe you should try and follow some rules and do it like a real person. And I was like, thanks, Dad. Um, so this is all his fault, for the record. And uh, so we actually uh, started Green to Go Delivery, and that's got its own checkered history. We got ran out of town after town. Uh, but in our first 15 months of uh, working our gray market medical dispensary uh, delivery service, we hired 15 full-time employees. So we grew at the rate of one FTE a month as a gray market unadvertised medical marijuana dispensary that had to deliver everything all over everywhere. Our delivery range was um, 90 miles wide and 60 miles tall, and we met 
Pizza Hut delivery time, 60 to 90 minutes, uh, anywhere in that range. And then once a week, we went out to Walla Walla and Dayton. Um, so we did that for three and a half years. Um, and we were really, really good at that. And then July 1st of 2015, the state said delivery is a felony. Uh, it's no longer gray, it is now just illegal to deliver. So they gave everybody some warning, they didn't just pull the rug out from us, so we uh, then sought a permanent location that met all the zoning restrictions that would not get us shut down. And so we uh, landed in Finley at our current location, um, and that was where we opened the Green to Go Collective Gardens walk-in. Um, so that's actually been open since uh, July of 2015 at that site. In the middle there, we also started Dab Vault Oil Processing. Uh, that was a BHO, a hydrocarbon extraction shop. We were probably in the first 25 in the state of Washington. Um, since then, we also ha had our hand in founding the, what is the world's largest um, CO2 oil processing lab in, in, in Washington state as well. Uh, but back to the retail stuff. Uh, we, oh, I guess CO2 processing plant. That was our first foray successfully into the I-502 thing. We opened up, again, what is, uh, it was a giant million dollar facility. Um, it, it sort of fell away as some startups do and is operating now without us. And we were uh, uh, lucky to come back to the Tri-Cities and move forward with what we got to do now. Um, we uh, still do consulting uh, for retailers and for producer processors because we've had our hand in every in uh, area of the industry. Um, a lot of the conversations we have with people aren't necessarily how do I grow weed or how do I make an edible or how do I sell pot. It's what is an ancillary need to the industry that people aren't planning for. I mean, the biggest thing in that regard is stuff that isn't handling cannabis, but that everybody that handles, handles cannabis needs. The regulatory restrictions around cannabis are immense, but there's a million things that everybody in the cannabis industry needs that have zero regulation. Um, and so we really try and help people figure out what those niches are. And if you already have a business, how do you put weed in front of it and then make way more money? Um, so that's really what we do for a lot of people. Um, we also have now, uh, and what we're most known for now, is Green to Go Recreational Cannabis. Uh, and we are now the only medically endorsed store in southeastern Washington State. Um, between Cle Elm and Spokane, the rest of the corner of the state, we're the only medically endorsed store. Uh, so we're the first in eastern Washington. And that still just involves cleaning out the, you know, uh, the proof that you have, whatever condition it is. Yeah, so the, the laws again changed a little bit on July 1st when they changed the rules and put all the gray market medical dispensaries out of business. And basically the state took over a registration pool. Uh, and, and this is, it's, it, we can go again for a really long time about this, but basically the rules used to be, you go to your doctor, you get an authorization for cannabis, there's a loose set of guidelines that you have to follow or that you should follow, and that is the end of that relationship. And annually you go back to your doctor and get a, a renewal and, and that's it. Now, it can be that way, and there's a very limited set of things that you can, rules you can exist under in that regard, or you can take that authorization your doctor gave you to us, and we enter you in a state database, and then you automatically get to grow more plants, you get to possess more, you get to buy more, you get to buy tax-free in any retail store in the state. Uh, and once medically approved products come out, you'll be able to buy things with higher dosages and higher quantities and all that stuff. Um, so for patients, it is really an exciting uh, move forward, especially as we see prices coming down in the industry below what they ever were on the black or gray markets previously. Um, it, it's gonna be, it's gonna be make it a lot more affordable. Um, so yeah, Green to Go Recreational Cannabis, we're now, we've been open 54 days, 53 days. Uh, we just came out with our uh, our last month report, uh, which I, if you're interested, uh, hit me up on Facebook, it's listed up there. Here's some photos. Uh, this is our little brand with our pineapple. Uh, if you guys are Reddit people, Reddit Trees is the internet cannabis community. The pineapple is the secret stand-in logo for marijuana, and that is why our logo is that. We started a long time ago by hiding it in our packaging where we had grids of weed leaves with just a pineapple in and slowly gained prominence until that became the main feature of our logo. This is a picture of me and my wife. This is me at our CO2 processing lab. And that is my wife in front of 750 pounds of weed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back one more time because it's worth a look. So what is the CO2 process? So that's actually able to extract the ingredients like the THC and the yep. CBD and yep. stuff? and CBN and CBG and all that stuff. Uh, it is a super critical processing environment. Um, so basically it's, it's a really high pressure distillation unit, essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. You put the cannabis in a tube, you fill that tube with liquid CO2 at an extremely high PSI. Uh, that PSI actually makes the CO2 liquid uh, go through polarization and turn into a solvent, uh, which then gets at all of the oil that you would normally get with a, a more traditional hydrocarbon. 
uh, and then once you actually distill away that liquid CO2, turn it back to gas, it physically drops all the oil left behind. And because CO2, when it's not under extreme pressure, isn't a solvent or toxic, yeah, it's, it's immediately right. non-toxic mm -hmm. and immediately safe and healthy, and, and you can't mess it up. Like, it's, it's foolproof. The one trade-off is that the equipment, like the one I'm standing in front of right there is a five liter processing machine, uh, and that one cost uh, $150,000. Um, so what lab kind of pressures are we talking about here? That like uh, 2,500 psi. Doesn't seem too unreasonable. I would think it's something like around maybe like 20 or 30 thousand, which would require like some. Oh, that would that would be too much uh, yeah. by a long shot. It would decimate the plant and, and you know turn it into. A, you'd get like every piece of chlorophyll. So basically, you have and this is way way more. We can go into this on a side sta stage. Oh, yeah, All the compounds in the plant have a different pressure that they then distill out at. So uh -huh. you can go up to twenty or thirty thousand psi and selectively get different compounds of the plant with mm -hmm. that solvent level, and that is part of the process. So depending on what you do, you can extract like five or six thousand psi depending on what you're trying to get at, and aim for different ranges of stuff that comes out of it. So there, there's there's tons of nuance to it, and it's a, it's a fun process. Um, so we've worked in this community a long time to get to the spot where we have a legal recreational cannabis store. Um, over the many years we've been lobbying for this and working with city councils and county commissions and debating people in power, um, these are the things they thought would happen. Increased danger in the communities, increased cost of law enforcement, increased use among youths, break-ins, robberies, violent crimes, increased fatalities on the roadways, federal involvement, no banking, and it won't be inexpensive enough to fight the black market um, because black market must be cheaper. So those are, those are the, the most common, ha ha, but we think we got you on this one, that we, we got back from the communities that we went into. Uh, what actually happened? Uh, increased jobs in communities. All these new businesses that are legal need places to work. Uh, Green to Go, when we were on the medical side, we employed seven people. Um, in now the first 50-ish days we've been open, we're now at uh, 26 FTEs at Green to Go. Uh, and all of our staff has been given raises, many to the point of up to 100% of their former raise. Um, all of our managers make forty to $50,000 a year, not including bonuses. Um, our hourly staff makes $15 an hour plus tips once they're permanent. So they actually take home about $22 an hour just to work behind the counter. Um, these are good jobs. These are jobs that people can buy houses with. Um, these are jobs that you can work and your spouse can raise your kids. So these are actual Hanford, Costco management, whatever your paradigm is for a decent job, that's what we're trying to offer. No extra cost of law enforcement. Uh, there has been zero studies that show any demonstrated extra cost to law enforcement. Uh, we totally called this out by saying whenever you make less crime, there's less need for law enforcement, and that has proven. Uh, the Actually, the other thing has happened. We now have a weird relationship with law enforcement because of our security system that we're forced to have under state law. It's so good that we regularly help law enforcement with their investigations. So our cameras are good enough that they can see license plates on cars driving down the road, and they can see when someone breaks into the gas station or the bar. Uh, but because our building is so fortified and people are rather afraid to steal from weed dealers, um, our building has been really, really secure. And we have all these great cameras. And because we're a legal business and our relationship with the police has changed, we we're so excited to provide them with all the HD footage we could ever have them help with to capture any criminals in our community because they are not in the best interest of a legal enterprise. So we get to be on the on the right side of that, which is our favorite thing. Uh, decreased use of youth among youths. Weird, uh, but nationwide, uh, the more legal weed gets, the less kids smoke it. And it is twofold. Uh, there's a lot of reasons, but the two big ones people talk about that they seem to agree on are Number one, with more regulation comes more rules and more people have more to risk to follow those rules. And just like when you go to a store, you can't buy beer without an ID. When you come to my store, we check your ID three times before we, you, we allow you to take cannabis from us. Um, no one's getting in our store and buying if they're underage. Um, part of that is because if we accidentally sell to a minor, they charge us with a felony and we get convicted of it because it was all an HD video. Um, and we have to pay $30,000 and shut down for a couple of weeks as a penalty. So we can't sell to minors. So we have these crazy policies. Drug dealers don't have those policies. They don't check ID. And when they open their trench coat, they might also have meth and cocaine and whoever knows what else down there. And we don't do that. We only sell state-tested, licensed, certified cannabis products that are relatively safe for your consumption if you're a responsible adult. So that's a big difference. Uh, the other big thing that's changed is that now more and more people are choosing cannabis instead of alcohol or wine uh, it's what we call the, the dad effect. Uh, once you've seen your dad high, it's way less cool, 
and you probably are less likely to do it. <laughs> and it's a serious thing. More and more parents are choosing it. It's becoming more normalized. And as it becomes not a bad boy thing to do, people are less excited to do it as a sense of rebellion because my mom and dad do that. So it's, it's getting different, which is actually a great thing. Uh, less break-ins, robberies, and violent crimes, that alludes back to what I was just saying. We all have crazy expensive security systems and we love to use them. So that has contributed demonstrably to less crimes and you know convicting people of crimes. In general, um, when you make things less illegal, there are less crimes. Uh, decreased fatalities on the roadways, true. In legal states, they are seeing uh, historically low highway fatality rates. Um, you can attribute that to whatever you want, but they all started going down right when we became legal. Uh, some people are choosing cannabis over alcohol. People that do, there's a class of people that will always over consume and drive. There's a class of people that will do every drug they can get their hand on, alcohol, weed, cocaine, whatever they can do, and then they're gonna get behind the wheel. There's a class of people that are gonna get a little buzz and then go home. That class of people, when they choose a weed over alcohol, they tend to not drive aggressively, they tend to not drive as quickly, uh, and there is a much lower risk of fatality because of their decisions if they, than if they were to choose alcohol or another hard drug. That's a thing we're seeing playing out in every legal state. And that's just so, a fact. Uh, I saw you in Colorado where they were comparing sober to uh, uh, just high marijuana, and uh, there was no statistical significance of this with the sober drive. Yep, we've seen a lot of things like that, and uh, over the years, more and more stuff like that will come out and, and ideally help create a foster a conversation about responsible use, and, and, and we'll get into that a little more later. Um, We've seen decreased fatalities on the roadways, which are great. We've not seen any federal involvement. The black helicopters, that we like to say, have not landed. There's no big SUVs coming in and taking everybody to jail. It has not happened. The feds, two years ago, said with the Cole Memo, if you stay away from organized crime, you keep it out of the hands of kids, you don't take it over state borders, you pay your taxes, you follow all applicable laws in your state, plus another couple that kind of repeat those, we'll let you go. We don't care. It's not worth our time. Um, they <laughs> held true to that. We will see what happens after January of next year, but I'm more worried about America in general than about what either of the sides will do to weed, because they both are kind of supportive. Um, so we think that'll be safe too. Banking is in fact available. Uh, we are super stoked. We have a, a business banking account with New America Credit Union. We have debit cards. We pay our payroll in cash or in check or direct deposit, no longer cash. Uh, we this week stopped paying any of our vendors in cash. Uh, when we started this all out, it was literally when we bought $20,000 worth of weed, you put a brick of $20,000 on a counter and you sat there and counted out together to make sure they got enough money. And now we just write them on a check and they take it and now they don't get hijacked on the highway for $20,000 in cash. Um, so that is way safer. Um, we are already at a price point where we're cheaper than the black market and we have caused the price on the black market to go up. Uh, what has happened is exactly the opposite of what many people would fear, and we hear a lot of this story, you put my weed dealer out of business. And the reality is, the margins when you're selling cannabis are not very good. It is not a good industry to be in. You have to move volume to make money, and if you're just a guy with 15 friends, it's a hard hustle, and you're doing it for five or six dollars an hour is the real truth. For all that criminal risk, it's not a very profitable industry. And we are already at the threshold where the middle level drug dealers are more interested to come to our store and buy legal, good quality rep cannabis and not risk going to jail, and then divert that for $5 extra a gram to somebody that doesn't have the ability to get there themselves. Um, so we're seeing that as sort of the paradigm shift in the, in the middle level criminal industry is Diet Coke diversion instead of you know supplanting the industry. So these people are rather opting to pay taxes and then smuggle it to Mexico even. Like that's the thing we're seeing is that in Mexico, shipments of cannabis that's been legally purchased from Washington and Colorado are being smuggled back across the border to resort towns and being sold for $500 to $1,000 an ounce to uh, tourists. So it is, it's already completely gone backwards, which is just crazy. Um, also, one of the other complaints we heard a lot of was, oh, what about my property values? Side thing, there have been two studies that have showed properties near cannabis production or retail facilities over the course of legalization have tended to go up 8 to 15%. Uh, because of their proximity to these desirable locations. So all these people that think it's gonna ruin everything, you know, my HOA is gonna go down, we're bringing property values everywhere up because all the people that now work for me that make 40 grand a year were making 25 grand a year last year. And now they can afford a house, and now they can afford a nicer house. And so 
And that sort of micro example happens across the entire industry. And again, every one of these businesses needs 20, 40, 50, 100 people to work it, and they all get paid pretty good because there's money in legal weed. The other thing that happened, this was as of May 2016, um, this was statewide. Uh, this is, so it's a little outdated, uh, but the first column is 2014, 2015, 2016. So these are the three uh, brackets of finance in our industry. Retail is the top, processor is the middle, producer is the bottom. So a producer grows cannabis, a processor turns that cannabis into stuff or puts it in a bag. A producer and a processor can be the same thing or they can be separate. Over on this other shelf is a retailer. If you decide to sell weed, that's the only thing you get to do. So they can watch you extra close because that's the point where they're worried about organized crime. So we're in the retailer section. Um, so these are the sales brackets, and you can see just through a cursory glance that the numbers are going up in every capacity amongst every line of activity. Uh, total sales uh, in 2016 were $357,988. Um, they're expecting that this year or next year might mark, probably next year will mark the first billion dollar year of activity in Washington State for cannabis activity. So it is an exponentially growing market. Um, and then at the very bottom is a bunch of excise taxes that are collected statewide. And we can show that in 2014 that it was a partial year, they only collected $16 uh, million. And in 2016, they collected something like $85 million. Um, that is rapidly going up as well. Um, let's see. The other thing that happened locally, this is actually Benton County. Um, 2014, 2015, 2016, you can just skip all the way down to the bottom to the excise tax collected. In 2016, Benton County collected $825,000 uh, in uh, excise tax uh, for cannabis sales. Now, the state is currently divvying that out and figuring out how much of that comes back, but on top of that was also sales tax that's not included in there. Uh, that just goes like any other sales tax. Um, we just did, I was gonna say, our July financials, and we put them out on Facebook, it's all public information. If you're interested in how what the finances of the cannabis industry look like, it's all open data. There are no secrets in the cannabis industry. Everything is public information. There's a website called 502data.com. The second Tuesday of every month, they open source every bit of data from every company in the entire Washington State cannabis industry. So you can see exactly how much John's Farm made and exactly how much Steve's Pot Shop made and exactly how much that oil company made every month, which is awesome. We love that. So that means I can tell you about how cool we're doing right now. So last month, uh, we generated just under a quarter of a million dollars in taxes in my one little retail store in Finley. Uh, $240,000 in combined taxes out there in uh, a 31 day month with two and a half cash registers. Um, right, That's isn't that crazy? That's really On the medical side, we were doing $1,500 to $3,000 a day um, gross, and now the taxes are way different, so we'll talk kind of net. Um, but right now we've gone from that fifteen hundred to three thousand dollar day mark to fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a day net seven days a week, and all it took was being able to open the doors to the public, and we <coughs> are open thirteen hours a day, with a line out the door eleven of those hours. Um, we are only limited by the number of cars in our parking lot, and the number of registers in our building, and the physical number of space we can fit, and how comfortable we can make the fifty people in line. We don't expect to see the end of our growth until we max out our property. Um, honestly, uh, our, our thought is that the Tri-Cities marijuana market, including recreational and medical, is probably worth about $5 million a month. Um, and that, I think, is a little bit of a conservative estimate. Um, there is a, an analogy for our community in Thurston County. Thurston County has 14 stores. Benton County has three, and only one of them serves town, and that's us. And Thurston County is doing four and a half million a month um, in legal sales. And they're not even getting at the black market because over there they're still kind of high priced. Um, so we'll see, but we think that it can still quadruple, quintuple, go as high as the sky is, especially as prices come down, especially as more stores open up, which we wait for, we can't wait for more com competition. Um, there is so much of a rising tide that we haven't seen a boat for miles. And it is, it's, it's such a great industry that we are so excited for anyone that wants to come in and try and help take some of the burden off and do right by the consumers. Because that's the other big thing we're doing right now. It's kind of filtering out all the bad people from, from the last round of things. Um, let's see. So this is just medical marijuana. As of July 1st, we integrated that into our uh, facility. We already talked about that a little earlier. Um, we're still the only store that does that right now. Um, 
and uh, we're going to continue to seek all of our staff to be trained so they can all be medical consultants, so it'll be a much smoother process as well. Um, Green to Go is currently undergoing a remodel process. We're waiting for approval from the state. Uh, we're going to jump from our three registers we currently have to uh, five permanent register stations plus a medical register, so six total. Uh, we're going to knock down a couple walls to make the flow through faster. We're going to pave the parking lot at a cost of about $35,000, $40,000. We added about $20,000 for the fences and landscaping. Um, this is a property we lease. We don't even own this place. Um, but I've already got thirty-five grand into making it better uh, because that's the only option you get in the cannabis industry is to find a landlord that's willing to rent to you and then you pay for everything from there. How are you going to do it? Like, how are you going to upgrade the facilities where you can keep the shop, keep the shop open? You do it at night. Okay. Yep, we pay people to work overnight. So you guys have a uh, Kenwick Street address, I think, mm -hmm. but also kind of in Finley. Yep. What, what's this legal situation? I know we're legal at the state level, but with the rest of the Tri-Cities, if Pasco or Kenwick or Richland wanted to have an inside city limits, would that be a county thing, a city thing? And what's so the, the right works is political climate? Yeah, happens? that's a great question. That's the one I spend the most time answering because really everyone that hears me talk for about five minutes is their first question is, how do I get one of these in my town? Um, and the reality is we have to elect new city councils and new county commissioners everywhere. Uh, and that's it. There are two options, and one is get new people in power. The other option is pass specific county or city legislation or codes that allow for this. But without an immense push of pressure from the, from the public, there is no will to change this because all the people currently in power are afraid of getting unelected. And even with what I would feel comfortable saying is Green to Go's quick and enormous success, they are still skeptical because we're the we're the nice ones, we're the good guys. You know, like not everybody can be like this, but the reality is they don't understand like what I'm saying. We're doing three quarters of a million dollars a month gross right now. I think we have the capacity to double that, and then I think there's the capacity to have five more stores that do that same amount before we even start to hit the plateau. So like there is so much space because the marketplace will get bigger as prices go down, as quality goes up, as education proliferates, as a culture builds acceptance and non-stigma, all of that will make it a bigger So price. it's just mainly city ordinances that the city council would have to vote Yes, on. so it is every single spot has their own, and basically the way it works is this. A city is a sovereign jurisdiction inside a county. So the city makes its rules, and inside that circle all those rules apply. The county makes its rules, but all of its rules are superseded by the city's rules in the middle. So if you're outside of city but in county, then county. Um, so right now, the way that works is all three cities all have bans or zoned moratoriums, which means they don't have a ban, but they've neglected to make even one square foot eligible for a development of that kind of business in their town, and they don't plan on changing it. Uh, and that's a way they can do it without the consent of the voters or any actual public policy, any you know anything. They can just say, this is administrative, there's no room for this in our community, and they can't get sued. So that's, that's the one thing. So all the cities have done that. The counties, uh, Franklin County, has banned. And that was, they will turn that over when the voters make them, was the exact words we got from the people in power there. Benton County had the foresight uh, to understand that at the very beginning, number one, Benton County has a longer growing season than almost anywhere else in the state. We, have, we love the agriculture. We're the agricultural hub of the world almost. We need cannabis to be growing here because the jobs pay better and the, and the crop yields are way higher and the money's way better. So they realized they didn't have to say no, and they also didn't have to say yes. And so they just didn't until the laws kicked in, and then they were like, oh, well, we missed that. And so since then, there's been a little bit of him and hawing, but they've always reverted back to state's rules apply, and they've really fought for us at this stage. We wouldn't be open if the Benton County people in power didn't specifically help us make sure that we were being treated fairly by the state. Um, so it is really... Each individual area has its own set of three to seven people that are 50 to 70 percent stopping it. Yes? So what about the small little unannexed uh, portions of Richland, for instance? Like, there's little mm -hmm. uh, parts that aren't actual city So annexed, there are state laws. Uh, uh, there are a list of protected entities that you have to be 500 or 1,000 feet away from. Okay. And so if you guys want to take the time, I did this in 2014 and 15. Uh, if you map every restricted entity in the Tri-Cities and then put a thousand foot buffer around it, there's like eight spots left in the entire inside city limits, including buffer zones, mm -hmm. and maybe three of them are zoned appropriately, mm -hmm. and that's where businesses already are. Mm -hmm. 
So it is it is already like there's just no options. They have done a really good job of building a list of restricted entities to keep these businesses out of small town residential areas. We we're good with that. We're mm -hmm. fine with that. Mm -hmm. If a town doesn't want this, they shouldn't have it. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is like be really proud about the jobs we make and the taxes we pay so we can convince them to want it. Because otherwise it's not gonna be a good thing for the community. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody should be forced to have something they don't feel comfortable with right. next to their home. Right. Uh, but yeah. we just really want to show everyone this is totally the right thing. <laughs> yes, I think one of the, well, with the I-5 with the data being open to everybody, I'm wondering what kind of one of the little apps can be spit out. It's, you know, it's an entrepreneurial level, like, uh, you know, I know that friends work with Wheat Maps and, uh, you know, Weekly, and so it's just kind of like, all right, well, here's all this new data. build on that, the reality of the situation is that that's exactly right. And there are two analogies, and the best one, I guess I'll just go with, is the farm community, the agriculture community, which makes up a third of our local economy. 20% uh, of our local jobs, a giant percent of our tax base, and is one of the things that we're most known for in our tourism and marketing. It is necessary, and it's awesome, and we are geographically well suited to have those industries here. But the reality is the farming industry doesn't exactly have a centuries-old track record of being environmentally responsible or fair labor practices or all these kind of awful things. But we all know hug a farmer. We all know they grow organic produce. We all know they make carrots and apples. And I love apple juice and I love carrots. And we all know that growing up we've seen farmers sponsor every rotary event, every school fundraiser, every dog show and fair exhibit you've ever seen has been in the back sponsored by Simplot or ConAgra or whatever the heck multi-gajillion dollar farm subsidiary company that's operating in our community and doing a great job at it for what they're doing. But it's all marketing. And the reality of business is community involvement is buying complicity over a decade or two or a hundred years or 200 years. And if you look over the course of history, there are many industries that started out as abominations that are now everyday things. And the only difference is they slowly got newspaper ads and they slowly donated to rotaries and they slowly did things like this. And that process is called normalization. And that's what this is. You guys are all part of my normalization experiment because <laughs> right now I'm We're feeding all you all of my reasonable <laughs> propaganda, hoping that this will make an impression. So whenever you hear someone say some outrageous bullshit, you could be like, no, I met a guy and he was totally not fucking crazy. <laughs> and he had some answers. And I don't think what you're saying sounds okay. And like that's really all we want. And as soon as we can get a majority of the population to a point where they just think twice, we've already won. And the truth is, as our population gets older, our LCB enforcement agent turned 21 after I-502 was passed. The guy that controls my future in life has never known an adult world where legal marijuana wasn't a thing. <laughs> that's a reality I'm already living in. There will be a time where the people that are so ingrained in the reefer madness they will become socially irrelevant. And it's not a nice thing to say, but the great thing is they will start to need medical cannabis <laughs> and those people will change their own minds when they can get a good night's sleep and when they can not take opiates that are killing their kidneys. The people that are younger than them, they're gonna get to try recreational cannabis and they got five or 10 years of novelty left where it's still like, we're a thing that, you know, they're gonna make TV shows about and that it's gonna be a thing. But the reality is we got 10 years left to buy into rotaries and dog shows and, and whatever we can do, build park benches and help our communities before the war of, are these farmers or are these drug dealers is over. And if we land on the, these are drug dealers side, it's done. It's done, it'll be taken over by the feds, it'll be deemed a medical substance by the FDA. If the industry is deemed a bad actor by the community at large, they will take all of this away. If we can somehow show them that we like following the rules, we love paying taxes, we're so excited to make a donation to your charity, thank you for asking us. If everyone can get that message, instead of buying cheetahs and Maseratis, we'll exist in 25 years. And the economic impact we will make will be multiplicative and defining of our generation. 
So that's what I'm hoping for is that that is the spirit that I can help perpetuate. So for for people who maybe are watching this at a later time or who have watched this and want to know what they can do that will make real change to advocate for the sort of changes that you're discussing, um, people running for things like city council or at least getting behind initiatives that push this forward, mm -hmm. what sort of suggestions do you have um, on where they can get involved, what's, what's available and what they can do to do? So a couple of things, um, and I'm talking directly to you camera people, uh, you people on the internet, like this is for you. Uh, if this lands today, today's voting day, so go out and vote. Uh, there are a few people around that aren't against the cannabis industry and that think what we're doing is great. Um, I've asked for a few of their explicit permission to say this person is pro-cannabis or pro-legal cannabis. The only person that's been able to come out to me and say I will openly support on the Republican side is Steve Simmons. Um, he's a great guy locally and he has said he is totally for regulated, legal, corporate cannabis in the most responsible way possible. I couldn't be happier with that dude. Uh, Everybody on the on the Democratic side has said, yay, pro-cannabis, we love the jobs, you're doing a great thing. Um, so if you tend to vote progressive, you can't make a wrong choice. If you're voting Republican, you care about cannabis, Steve Simmons is a guy you gotta support. Um, George Fearing, another guy that is a very reasonable person about this stuff, but past the personal political shills, um, the, the two things you can do are either run for office <laughs> or find out about somebody that's running for office that supports this stuff and vote for them. The second thing you can do is don't do some crazy shit while you're high. Like, know that if you're gonna try an edible for the first time, you need to wait 90 minutes to two hours before you do anything else in your life until you know how that's gonna hit you. We have gotta build a culture of responsible recreation and making slow and careful decisions about how we talk about this and how we perpetuate the story of this to our friends and family. And if we can all get through five years of saying, you know, I don't know anybody that's crashed their car into a telephone pole because they were too high and playing Pokemon Go. And it's just, I know a guy that crashed into a telephone pole because he was playing Pokemon Go. That's a win. Anytime someone gets in the news for doing something stupid and it doesn't say he was also high, that's a win. So the other thing you can do is be a responsible cannabis consumer. If you are smoking weed, please learn the laws and follow them. Don't take any risks. Don't do anything stupid. Keep it away from your kids and pets. Lock it up. Call us. We'll give you advice, but don't ruin this for the rest of us. That's that's what you can do. See, the better question I have here is uh, uh, with uh, industrial hemp and whether or not people are allowed to start growing that, given that I thought was involved. No, there's no. a separate thing. Industrial hemp isn't cannabis, uh, and there was a specific piece of legislation uh, spouted out to define those as separate things. Industrial hemp is moving forward. Oregon has some licenses. I think Washington has two licenses. There's some other states with licenses. Um, it's moving forward. That is a way easier fight than anything with recreational cannabis. If you guys are pro-industrial hemp, get on it, call your legislators, start sending letters. That is another, that's a bigger industry than recreational weed. Industrial hemp could do more economic good than legal pot can, to be honest. Yeah, that's what we have a few farm guys over there. Mm -hmm. Dry land crops, they take pollutants out of the soil. They, you know, you can crop five times, six times a year without any irrigation. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, industrial hemp is amazing. Plus, industrial hemp creates CBD in an unregulated format, so you can derive industrial hemp CBD that's chemically the same as cannabis CBD as an isolate, but it can come from industrial hemp, so it's not regulated like a cannabis product is, and it can be sold across state lines. So there's also a pseudo medicinal I, I can't actually say that because I'll get in trouble but there's if you believe in whatever you've read about CBD it can be derived in the same chemical format from industrial hemp from the stocks uh, and because again it's industrial hemp isn't technically illegal like weed is once it's made you can as long as you have the certificate from the lab that made it that shows it was made from industrial hemp and not cannabis you can drive all over the country with that stuff so like there's a bunch of like little legal loopholes that happen because of industrial hemp that are really cool to learn about too if you want to like geek out over the wonky stuff There's like, I don't know the specific number, so I'll say a gajillion uh, to not embarrass myself further. But there's like, <sighs> cannabinoids are like, um, like a football team. Uh, and a football team might have 100 players, uh, but you only really give a crap about about 11 of them. Um, same with, with cannabinoids. There's a ton of them. We might not even know all the ones that are out there technically. The easiest ones in science to always read out first are the ones with the biggest impact. So THC is the first one, that's the psychoactive one that gets you high. 
that has several chemical forms, THCA, Delta-9 THC, um, I think THCN, don't quote me on that, uh, but you have uh, CBD and you have CBDA, the acidic form, and, and CBG and CBN, and um, there is, you can get a good infographic, we shared stuff on the Green to Go Facebook that goes over maybe the top 100 cannabinoids. Um, because scientific study has been prohibited legally, because there's been no grant money for studying a class one felonious substance, um, it's hard to find good science about any of this stuff. And so one of the cool things we're seeing is there's rumors that the DEA is gonna reschedule later this year down to two. We hope they do it down to schedule three, which will have banking in any legal state. But if they go down to two, basically what that'll be doing is allowing universities and hospitals to more readily apply for research licenses to actually root out what some of these cannabinoids do. Um, because right now there really is only studies on THC, CBD, and CBN, and CBG. And again, I can't actually tell you any of their medicinal benefits because I sell recreational cannabis, um, so, and I'm not a doctor. So look it up on the internet, and probably most of the stuff you read is pretty credible at this stage. But even with the recreational, they, you know, they're starting to read the strains that are higher in CBD. And totally. Yep, and so now in our stores we have the medical professionals and those people can actually talk to you. So we have certified medical professionals that are certified cannabis medical professionals at our facilities. We're currently training all of our staff to have that certification. Once they have that card from the state, they actually can answer questions like, what does CBG do? Will it help with my arthritis? So we actually have people trained at Green to Go that can have that conversation with you. Even though I'm the owner, I'm still not one of those people yet, so I just have to opt out. Um, but come to our store, ask for Eric Kalia. He's our medical professional right now. Um, soon all of our staff will be certified. All right, if anybody else has any questions you want on camera, I'm going to stop the recording, but we can keep having a conversation. Okay. Anybody want? Thank you so much for your time.